Welcome, everyone. My name is Adam Levine, and I am director of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies here at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. And I'm really pleased to welcome you all today to our commencement forum titled Building the Peace, Managing and Preventing uh, Conflicts in an Increasingly Complex World. The mission of our center is to promote a more just, peaceful, and secure world by furthering a deeper understanding of global human rights and humanitarian challenges and encouraging collaborations between local communities, academics, and practitioners to develop innovative solutions to these challenges. We believe that interdisciplinary and interprofessional collaborations, especially those that involve affected communities themselves, are the best ways to identify lasting solutions to some of our world's most vexing problems. Our center is relatively new here at the Watson Institute, having been launched just three years ago in 2019. But since then, we've grown rapidly with two full-time staff, more than 10 paid research assistants, two visiting scholars, multiple ongoing research and training grants, and numerous collaborations with various UN agencies and international non-governmental organizations. We also support a wide range of student programming here at the Watson Institute, from paid summer internships with leading human rights and humanitarian organizations, to our annual Hack for Humanity event, our student clinic for immigrant justice working with asylum seekers here in Rhode Island, and a variety of courses taught by our affiliated faculty. And today, I'm pleased to announce to all of you a brand new effort. Later this summer, we will be launching Brown's first ever human rights and humanitarian alumni group. We know there are hundreds, if not thousands, of Brown alumni working in the human rights and humanitarian fields, whether it be with governments, UN agencies, civil society, or academia. We also know that there are many, many students here at Brown who are really excited to launch their own careers in the human rights and humanitarian fields. We anticipate that this new human rights and humanitarian alumni group will offer Brown alumni new opportunities for professional development and networking, while also providing students access to career advising and mentorship. So we encourage all alumni here with us today who are working or interested in human rights and humanitarianism to sign up for our new alumni group, either on our website or by scanning the QR code on the poster located next to the exit or in the lobby. When you sign up, we would love to hear your thoughts and suggestions about how we can make this new alumni group a success that works for all of our alumni and our students here at the Watson Institute. And now, I am very pleased to introduce our esteemed guest who's here with us this morning. Rosemary DiCarlo was appointed Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs in May 2018 by United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres. As Under Secretary General and Head of the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, Ms. DiCarlo advises the Secretary General on peace and security issues globally while overseeing good office initiatives and field-based political missions, carrying out peacemaking, preventative diplomacy, and peace-building activities around the world. She also sees, oversees the electoral assistance provided by the UN to dozens of member states each year. Mr. Carlo brings more than 35 years of experience in public service and academia. In 2010, she was appointed by President Obama as Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations, in that capacity, she represented the United States at the Security Council, General Assembly, and other United Nations bodies. Prior notable assignments with the U.S. State Department included Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs and Director for Democratic Initiatives for New Independent States, where she oversaw efforts to promote democratization in the former Soviet republics. Her overseas tours took her to the United States embassies in Moscow and Oslo, she also served at the National Security Council as Director for International Organizations. Mr. Carlo served as President and CEO of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy from August 2015 to May 2018, and was concurrently appointed a Senior Fellow and Lecturer at Yale University's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, where she taught a graduate course on multilateralism, multilateral institutions in the 21st century. Born here in Rhode Island, Mr. Carlo graduated from Brown University with a BA in Comparative Literature and an MA and PhD in Slavic Languages and Literature. She speaks both French and Russian. So please join me in welcoming here today. So 
Rosemary, let me first start by welcoming you home to Rhode Island. It's so wonderful to have you here with us today, both as a Rhode Islander and as a triple alumna of Brown University. And if you don't mind starting with a somewhat personal topic, I know many in our audience today would love to hear about your own personal story, how you made it from Brown University to Under Secretary General at the United Nations. Thank, thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. It's been a long time since I've been on campus, so it's uh, actually very pleasant uh, to be with you all uh, during commencement weekend. Uh, I hope the mic is working and you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Um, I, you know, I was uh, as an undergrad. I really focused on uh, literature uh, and decided uh, didn't really know what to do. Frankly, so I just I stayed with it and decided to deepen my knowledge of Slavic languages in, in literature. Um, during that period, I was able to travel to Moscow on an exchange program. I spent six months uh, living in a dorm in Moscow State University. Uh, and it was then I, that I realized that I wasn't really sure I wanted to stay dealing with literature the rest of my life. I got a little bit into the political aspects of things. Um, went to Paris to finish my dissertation. Uh, and while I was in Paris, also realizing that I needed to earn some money, uh, I got a position at UNESCO um, and working in their educational sector. I was writing a journal. It was for my writing skills that I was hired, not for my knowledge of, of education. Um, stayed there for a few years. Um, and it was a period, it was a really interesting period for me. I worked with people from countries I'd never heard of before. Uh, and realized, you know, I'm, I wasn't going to give it up. I really wanted to be working in the international area. Um, U.S. was leaving UNESCO uh, at that time, uh, and I married someone who was a State Department official, uh, and uh, decided I'd throw my hat in the ring, and I joined the Foreign Service. And I had 30 years uh, that were pretty exciting, I have to say. I had two tours in Moscow. I was there. Um, at the end of the Soviet period, when everything was opening up and Gorbachev was the general secretary, went back in the mid-90s uh, when Yeltsin was president. And it was a bit the Wild West, if you will. But we were trying really hard uh, to help uh, Russia develop certain institutions. Um, and um, it was a pretty exciting time. And I moved on and started doing work on the Western Balkans uh, when I came back to uh, Washington. Um, this was right after the Kosovo crisis, uh, and I uh, was very engaged in negotiations on Kosovo status when I was still at the department, and then also working on Bosnia-Herzegovina. Last thing I think we were focused on during that period was getting some of the countries uh, in the region prepared for NATO membership and EU membership. Then I came back kind of to my old life, uh, and that was the UN. I went up to New York thinking I would spend one year there, ended up spending six years at the US mission to the UN, working primarily on issues that came before the Security Council. It was a pretty uh, wild time for us at that time. We were dealing with Syria. We were dealing with um, Iran, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, DPRK, uh, a whole range of issues uh, that, unfortunately, many of which are still with us today. Uh, it was time to retire. I was at the age, so I retired, thinking that that was OK. I had a pretty good career. Uh, a friend of mine asked me if I would head this small nonprofit in New York that uh, did track two uh, diplomacy, track two exchanges and with China and Russia, uh, and then some public events. So I decided I would do that, get my, give it a try. Um, I didn't realize I had to raise money also to keep the nonprofit going. That was the hardest part of the job. Uh, then. Um, was asked if I would teach a course at Yale, uh, the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, and did one course uh, a year for three years. Uh, and frankly, very happy with my little life in New York uh, when somehow um, someone asked me if I wanted to be considered uh, to go into the UN itself as Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. I said, fine, why not? <laughs> never, never expected to get the job. I have to tell you, I'm the first female to hold the position. I think it's one of the reasons I got the job, but I'm very happy about it. <laughs> um, and it's been four years that I've been there, and I have to say it's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, I work as, on political peacebuilding affairs. Uh, we've got a lot of political missions, envoys around the world. I do not do 
uh, peacekeeping, I don't have any military to back me up, so I have no boots on the ground anywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, since you mentioned it, I uh, just actually recently returned from UN Humanitarian Networks and Partnerships Week in Geneva, and I'm always impressed by how the United Nations system seems to proliferate the number of acronyms and terms that we use. And um, I was hoping maybe you could put on your academic hat for a moment and help us understand the differences between some of the things you mentioned, between peacemaking, peace building, peacekeeping. These are terms people probably hear in the news and probably don't realize they mean different things. Okay. I, I will try. And we do have a lot of acronyms, and we keep creating new ones, I will tell you. Um, but on, on the um, issue of peacemaking, basically it's to help parties to a dispute resolve their differences peacefully. Uh, so not going to military action or getting them away from military action and trying to negotiate a ceasefire, a settlement. Um, you know, we call them peace talks or peace negotiations. Uh, obviously, you have to have the support of the parties in question and the desire for them to really be at the table uh, and uh, negotiate. Um, and the ones that are successful, the, the various peace talks that are successful have strong support from the international community or at least the regional stakeholders. Um, we also, I would call peacemaking, what we're doing around the world in setting up political missions. And these are political missions, not peacekeeping, not, as I said, no boots, that help parties implement a settlement uh, or a peace agreement. Uh, we've got a number of them uh, now, and I can give you some examples. We have one in Colombia. Uh, we have, I would also say that I would call our uh, political mission in Afghanistan, which was actually started in 2002 after the Taliban was overthrown, uh, such a mission. Now we're actually, the Taliban are back in power, but we're trying to deal with them and sorting things out, moving forward and having them adhere to uh, international law and human rights. Um, and uh, I would give the difference between, as I said, peacemaking and peace uh, keeping. Peacekeeping, we deploy military, UN peacekeepers. They're there with the consent of the government or the parties in question. Uh, they do not do peace enforcement. In other words, they do not, they only act and use military force in self defense. Um, but they also help uh, with, for example, um, uh, disarming former militia, uh, reintegrating them into society, uh, help with implementation of various settlements uh, going forward. And very often, they've got a monitoring role for a ceasefire because there's still some skirmishes happening. Uh, and a uh, big focus on protecting civilians and make sure that, making sure that civilians don't get caught, caught in the conflict. Um, on the issue of peace building, um, Peace building normally is for countries coming out of conflict. We normally consider that the, our actions peace building, and that's to help them deal with the root causes of conflict so that they don't relapse into conflict again. Uh, we are also now expanding our peace building activities to fragile countries, helping deal with root causes before a conflict erupts. Thank you. That's excellent. So. Um, as I understand it, a big part of the UN's mission, and especially your Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, is to prevent conflicts even before they have a chance to begin. It seems, though, to do that, you have to actually know where the conflicts are likely to begin in the future. What tools do you have at your disposal to be able to predict which countries are most at risk for conflict, and then to help build peace in those countries, and, and which ones do you find most effective? Well, I think, first of all, just uh, in terms of how do, we, how do we prevent conflict and how do we know a conflict is brewing? Uh, I mean, we've got a series of indicators that we look at and we talk about early warning. I mean, one of the biggest problems, frankly, in preventing conflict is not about early warning, it's about early action. Uh, so indeed, while the, war, you know, the, the warning signs are there, I mean, we see this now impact of climate change, for example, uh, on farmers and herders, you know, arid lands, displacement of populations. Uh, we see it in poor, poor governance, uh, in elections that go awry. Uh, and our goal is to try to prevent it from escalating, obviously. And ideally, we would try to prevent anything that makes the country more fragile as well. How do we do it? Um, well, we have a whole series of envoys. We've got a standby team. 
uh, who help us uh, going out and trying to disperse a particular dispute. Um, some of them are actually full time. Some of them we um, employ when we see, when we see the need. Um, we also work a lot on electoral processes. What we found is that elections in and of themselves are not a cause of conflict. But in a country that already has problems, an election can spark conflict. Uh, so we provide uh, a lot of support to countries around the world uh, in electoral processes. And, and the support starts early on. It can start two years before an election, looking at voter rolls, uh, voter education, all kinds of things to, hope, to help them get through a process that then is considered uh, legitimate by all parties. Not so easy, I have to be clear on that. But it, we think it's extremely important because we've seen far too often uh, when um, an election then turns into something pretty bad. I'll give you an example of one, one thing that we did when an election did go badly, and that was in Bolivia uh, when Morales lost. We saw the tensions on the ground. We were really worried we were going to see armed conflict big time. Um, we sent out our envoy, one of our best, uh, and we created a, a project with him, with our human rights folks, uh, with our development folks, to work with the parties to really map out a strategy for going forward. I mean, this was over a six, eight month period that finally brought them to peaceful elections and elections that were accepted by everyone. Now, um, it's just one example. We've done it elsewhere, but that one stands out really very much in mind. The, the other thing is we've got regional offices that work um, in different parts of the world, and mostly in Africa. We have three in Africa, one West Africa, one Central Africa, one for the Horn of Africa. They're permanent, and they're working fairly, you know, constantly in trying to diffuse a conflict from happening. Very hard to prove that you prevented something from happening, I have to be honest with you. So whenever I have to defend this to the budget committee, I try to give as many examples as possible. But they say, but how did you know? How do you know? I say, because I feel it. But <laughs> and we don't want to risk it. Uh, and uh, the other thing I would say is that we, we really, the whole point is to help countries help themselves. So we deploy around the world. I think they're in 60 different uh, locations now something called Peace and Development Advisors. And they are to work with the governments in helping build the capacity for them to prevent conflicts in their own country, helping them with early warning signs uh, as well. What works best? It works best when you've got the support of, in particular, regional players and the international community behind you. If you've got a united group of stakeholders, it works best. When they are not united, as they are in places like Libya, for example, it's very hard. So I know when we think about conflict today, one of the first things that comes to people's minds is Ukraine. Mm -hmm. With over 6.2 million refugees and 7 million internally displaced, it's on track in just its first three months to become the largest refugee crisis in the world. We know that hindsight, of course, is always 2020. But in retrospect, uh, do you think there were ways to anticipate and prevent this war? And what lessons does it provide for future 21st century conflicts? Um, I think it's it's hard really to say whether it could have been prevented. What I what I would say is that there was already a conflict in Ukraine right, from 2014. Uh, there already were you know, there was occupying forces from Russia in both the eastern part of Ukraine, the Donbas, and in Crimea. There were skirmishes. Uh, yes, there was an agreement or agreements, the Minsk agreements, but they were not fully implemented. Uh, there were there was mediation uh, by the OSCE and it was periodic. There were periodic sessions in the UN Security Council, uh, but I think there was a sense that it's just another one of these protracted conflicts, and I do not believe that we can allow protracted conflicts to continue because then they erupt and they erupt in this case in a really horrific fashion. Uh, we saw a year ago now. Uh, a little bit over a year ago, uh, what happened in Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan. That had been you know, brewing for, for however many years, decades, uh, and then finally broke out into armed conflict again. So I think this, that's one important lesson, that you just can't let something slide. Um, and we see protracted conflicts in various places in the world. We should be paying far more attention to them. Uh, the second thing is that how much a war on European territory can really impact on the rest of the world. 
I think it's absolutely incredible to see what we're dealing with now on food insecurity, energy prices, financial transactions, which are becoming more difficult. Um, this, is, this is immense, and this will affect um, many countries. It's one of the in things that we are looking at, particularly on food. Uh, food insecurity. We know when there are food shocks that it's often the cause of unrest and sometimes even violent conflict in countries. So we've got, as far as the prevention agenda is concerned, we've got a lot there to do. And then the, the last thing I would say is that I think it's pretty clear, given the threats of nuclear weapons and, and the concerns about possible use of chemical weapons, that there really needs to be a redoubled effort uh, to deal with disarmament uh, of weapons of mass destruction. I think that's clear going forward. Um, obviously, what's happening in Ukraine, we don't know how it's going to end. It's going to affect, it already is affecting um, relations between men, among major powers. Uh, we're going to have to really look at how we maintain peace going forward. Um, last year, the Secretary General uh, announced a, a new initiative. He was calling it Our Common Agenda. Uh, and he wanted a compact with member states about how we deal with development, human rights, peace and security. We started working on what we were calling the new agenda for peace. Uh, we know now we need to rewrite what we were doing. We've got a lot of work to do going back to the drawing board. I know that um, aside from Ukraine, there are many conflicts around the world that your department has been involved in uh, over the past few years, uh, some that make the headlines, like Syria and Yemen, and some that don't, like the Central African Republic. Uh, which ones um, have you been particularly engaged in and seen the most progress? And as a corollary to that, which areas of the world that are not yet in conflict are you most worried about? Well, thank you. I mean, I'm not saying that these are the most important ones, but the ones that I've been most involved with over the last year. Afghanistan, uh, Sudan, Somalia, um, also Ethiopia, and Ukraine. Now, the first three, we have a mandate from the Security Council. Uh, we have missions on the ground, um, work in progress. Uh, as I mentioned, we've been in, the UN's been in Afghanistan since 1949 in one form or another. A lot of humanitarian, not necessarily political. But in 2002, um, we, we went in with a fairly sizable political mission. It's, it's our biggest political mission. We have I think, over 300 internationals and over 1,000 national employees uh, to work on a whole range of issues, you know, rule of law, elections, human rights, across the board. Um, what happened last August was a shock, I think, to everyone. And uh, it has been really challenging now to try to maintain some of the gains that were made frankly, uh, in Afghanistan. And I think you know, day, each day seems to bring uh, you know, a backtracking on women's rights. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, working with not only our mission, member states in New York, but with the Taliban directly. I traveled there in December, and I was, I was actually encouraged uh, to see that they were listening, uh, particularly when we spoke about women's rights. Um, but then Again, it hasn't, it hasn't come to pass. So we've got a, a tremendous amount of work we've got to do there in marshalling support to move the Taliban in a better direction. Um, I mentioned uh, Sudan. Uh, things were going extremely well. We, were, we set up a mission. We were working with Sudan on the transition, on a democratic transition, moving toward elections in a few years. And then a military coup last October has thrown us back. So a huge amount of effort there in trying to get things on track. Uh, Libya. Um, Again, we made a huge progress in Libya with peace agreement. Uh, we were moving toward elections. And then again, it uh, started to unravel. And we are still struggling to get it back on track. Uh, Ethiopia, I, what can I say? Horrific, horrific violations of human rights. Terrible suffering on the humanitarian side. Unbelievable. Access has been very, very hard. Uh, we're still trying. Uh, the prime minister tells us that he wants to move forward. He wants a national dialogue. He wants peace. We do have a truce right now, so we are getting humanitarian uh, aid into um, the Tigray region, but a lot more to do. And then Ukraine, we talked about it. Uh, it's been a huge challenge, not just because of Ukraine itself, but the impact it's having on the relations among member states, particularly in the Security Council, where much of the work is stalled because of disagreements with the Russian Federation.
and to some degree China. What works best? It works best, as I said, even with the conflict prevention, when you've got the international community behind you. When we see what's happening in Libya, we have different groups supporting different, different uh, parties. See the same thing in Sudan. Uh, and Afghanistan, since we do seem to have a more united international community, I hope we can make a difference. Thank you. <clears throat> In her 1938 essay, Three Guineas, Virginia Woolf responds to a letter from a male colleague asking her opinion on, on how best to prevent war by recommending investing in women's education and professional opportunities. Nearly a century later, that realization that women are integral to peacemaking and peace building finally seems to have great, gained some widespread acceptance, especially within the UN community. Can you talk a little bit about the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda and why it's so important to the work of your department and the world as a whole? Thank you. Well, I mean, obviously, you know, women are half, make up half of humanity. Uh, I would say that it's not just because having them involved in various activities is better for peace. It's also their right <laughs> to be engaged. Um, we, we've made a policy of providing 17% of our funding toward women, toward women and women's issues, and, and we're dealing in the area of peace and security, of course. Uh, and then, of course, other parts of the UN are doing development work um, and many other kinds of, um, of activities with women. We've seen that when women are part of peace processes, that uh, peace agreements last longer. Uh, we know that you know, conflict has a different impact on women. I'm not saying that they're, I mean, some people will say they're disproportionately affected. I would say that it's different how they are affected. Uh, we've seen conflict-related sexual violence. Uh, we know that we look, look back to Rwanda when all the men were killed and women were there without jobs, without training, uh, having to take over a society, unable to inherit property because of property laws. I mean, there's so many things that disadvantage women going forward. If you look at Ukraine today, we have all of these women and children who are fleeing. Their husbands remain in war, at war. We've already seen instances of trafficking, uh, and we know that they're very vulnerable. And they're also going to foreign countries, many of them not with the proper, let's say, um, professional tools to be able to work. So it's extremely important uh, for us to have women engaged uh, in society, in uh, political life, in public life, uh, and also, but also in peace processes. And we've tried really hard to get women more and more at the table. It's not easy. Um, and we started with, first of all, creating women's advisory groups for different of, of our envoys. We did one for Syria, we did one for um, Iraq, uh, and we did one for Yemen. Um, eventually, we've seen that, for example, on the Syrian advisory group, many of those women are now at the table for the, at the Constitutional Committee. Now, I know Syria is not at peace, we know that. But still, the fact that we've managed to get some women at the table we think is extremely important going forward. On Libya, when we carried out a, a major political dialogue, 22% um, female. Um, on Yemen, when we carried out uh, a, a negotiations a couple of years ago uh, for, to open up the port of Hodeidah, we had one woman at the table, and obviously none from the Houthi delegation. When we were dealing with Afghanistan and we were supporting the negotiation process that the UN and Qatar were leading, uh, we were begging the Taliban to include women in their delegation. We were even offering them extra seats so that there would be 10 on the side of the government and maybe 13 on the side of the Taliban. Never happened. Uh, it's a challenge going forward. It needs to, needs to be uh, nurtured. Uh, women need to be trained as mediators. We're doing some training. We're working a lot with um, regional organizations, particularly the African Union, in, trading, in training women mediators. Um, but it's a work in progress. Thank you. So it's often said that there are two types of peace. There's the big peace where warring parties meet in Geneva, often under the auspices of the UN, to sign a comprehensive peace deal. And then there's the little piece where individual communities, often in impoverished settings and employing traditional means, work together and with local armed actors to diffuse tensions and diffuse conflicts. How important are these little peace efforts in the grand scheme of things? And what does the UN or what can the UN do to support them? Yeah. Um, they're very important. I mean, I think it, some, some will say peace is made locally. Uh, and it's, it's extremely important. 
uh, to one uh, support these uh, activities. Uh, we have uh, we've done some training of local mediators, uh, provided support, provided advice. They've actually trained us as well because local mediation is very different from mediation at a, at the national level. Uh, and uh, I would say that we've used some of our envoys, particularly our regional offices in Africa, to be able to go out into communities and work with communities. And it's particularly uh, dealing with the farmer herder conflict, the, infl the impact of uh, climate change, uh, which is having a huge impact on security. Um, and what is missing? Two things, funding. It takes a lot of effort uh, to get people out there and to do these sorts of things, a lot of funding. Uh, and in some cases, support from national authorities. Great. So in just a moment, I'll open it up to questions from the audience. And those who do have questions, I would urge you to come up to one of the two mics, and we can call upon you in order. Um, so feel free to come up now. And while people are coming up, I'll just ask one final question of my own. I know that we have a lot of graduating uh, students in the room, as well as alumni, who are interested in pursuing uh, uh, careers in peace and security, what advice would you give to them based on your experience working in this world for the last okay. 35 years? Well, first I would encourage them. Uh, I think it's been uh, uh, really fascinating. I, you know, it's not that I don't like literature, but I'm glad I decided to make a turn. Uh, and uh, I would say, though, that be broad in, in what you are looking for. Uh, there are many kinds of organizations uh, that do this kind of work, whether it be a, a multilateral organization, a national government, uh, an NGO. So, you know, look look very closely at the scene. Don't just focus on a couple of places that, where you think um, you need to serve. The, the other thing, I mean, it is important to know languages and to know societies. And I found that living on my own uh, in foreign countries gave me probably the most support that I needed and the most information, help that I needed when I was finally working in bureaucracies, um, carrying out similar, conducting these kinds of activities. Uh, you learn a lot more if you're there fending for yourself. Um, I would also, uh, just for those of you graduating, don't ever be deterred by the fact that you didn't get a job. Every time I, there was a job that I didn't get, I would then get an, a job that was far better than the job that didn't, the guy that didn't want me. And so just keep at it, uh, never get discouraged uh, in that. And also, I, I was, I've always felt that um, I did better at things that I liked and I felt I was good at, as opposed to what somebody thought I should be doing to make it my way up the ladder. So I would encourage you to take the positions that really make you happy and where you feel you can make a difference. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we'll take the first question here. On. Go for it. Okay. Uh, over the past 10 or so years, we've seen political shifts in the United States. America first, out of NATO, in NATO, et cetera. What do you see as the impact on the international community of our own political changes uh, going on? Yeah. Look, I think um, no matter what um, <coughs> My interlocutors felt about the United States and the United States policies. Uh, it was always clear that the, internet, that the United States is needed. I can't tell you the number of times when I was working at the US mission to the UN where I would get calls from um, ambassadors from countries that I felt were not particularly well disposed toward the US saying, your government's got to get involved here. This is important. Uh, and we need the United States. And I hear this time and time again when I'm in the UN system. It is extremely important for the United States to be engaged in world affairs. Uh, and it's part of the security of the United States. I mean, it's also in self-interest. It's not just uh, altruistic uh, at all or humanitarian. And I, and I do, you know, I do feel that, um, that the US has been a force for good uh, in the world and has made a difference on many occasions. And I would just hope that they can stay engaged and be as in, more engaged uh, going forward. And certainly it will be needed. As I said, we're, we're looking at a new world right now in terms of foreign relations. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I'm gonna um, key right off of that. And could you comment on the balance of powers between China, India, you know, ourselves uh, and, and Russia and 
how, uh, in particular, how our alignment is with India, maybe now relative to what we might have thought, and China, obviously. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm speaking as a UN official, <laughs> so. <laughs> so it's going to make it a little difficult, but uh, uh, yeah, let, let me just say that um, Right now, I mean, if you look at the UN Security Council right now, where the major powers are, and India is now has a, a two-year seat on the council, um, it's dysfunctional. Okay, I can say this publicly. I'll, I won't get in trouble for this. I think everybody everybody uh -huh. understands. Uh, and there are some really major differences about how one conducts oneself in world affairs. Uh, for example, well, you know, you, you, you hear me as the, you know, the conflict prevention, the so-called interventionist, if you will. We have a, a, a problem sometimes on getting support for what we call conflict prevention uh, and even mediation uh, because some view this as interference in domestic affairs of another country. Uh, we don't see it as that way. We see it as preventing a worsening situation. Um, so there is that there is that tension, and that's one of the basic tensions. Uh, and I mean, yes, the U.S. has been on and off about how engaged they are uh, in the world. On the other hand, I think you know that sort of the mentality of most Americans is we can get in there and fix it, right? Uh, or you know, we have to be there. Uh, so um, it 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 causes it, it's a cause for concern. Obviously, I mean, from a very U.N. perspective, it is very hard for us to see the tensions that are happening now between the US and China, the US and Russia. We need everybody to be supportive of the principles on which the organization is based. Uh, we, we need the cooperation. And when you think of what, what has been done when then countries do cooperate, I mean, look at all of the initiatives in counterterrorism. Uh, and many of them were pretty much US-Russia focused. I mean, they were leading. Um, some of the issues on non-proliferation, again, uh, really important issues where we need to have the kind of unity that we had before. I should just add, and on climate change, mm -hmm. we're going to need a lot of unity there. Hi, first of all, thank you so much for coming, and this was a wonderful lecture. Um, I'm interested in the UN's involvement in Afghanistan specifically. Um, a lot of you know what I hear in like typical media is a lot about like the human rights situation and how human rights situation is deteriorating, especially about the recent you know ban on education and for women, et cetera. Um, but what I hear less about is the liquidity crisis there and the food crisis there and the lack of technical personnel there and the fact that civil servants aren't being paid and this is essentially causing sort of a cyclical crisis, um, a very dire humanitarian situation where people just can't afford to live. Um, and then those two things are really at c contest with each other, where these Western states that have the technical capacity and financial capacity to support the food crisis um, aren't willing to, you know, contribute because of the deteriorating human rights situation in Afghanistan. So my question to you is, how does the UN or UNAMA or, you know, any the Office of Political Affairs, anyone, like how does the UN attempt to balance those priorities? Um, and how does, like, how have you facilitated that conversation? Great, great question, thank you. Um, first of all, we were well aware uh, after the Taliban came in um, that given the economic situation, we had a potential for this country to implode, affecting the entire region, uh, perhaps spawning more terrorism and terrorist acts around the world. <gasps> Um, and we made very clear to our major donors, major countries uh, on the Security Council, that there was a need to do more. Now, as far as straight humanitarian assistance is concerned, you know, supply of food or medicines, countries were willing to come forward with funding, and they were quite generous. But we needed more. It needed to be what we were, first we were calling it humanitarian plus, but it's basic, basic human needs. You can't run a hospital if you don't have medical workers who are paid, right? You know, you can't just deliver supplies. You've got to pay the medical workers. You can't teach girls in school if you don't have teachers because teachers aren't being paid. There are a whole range of things that needed to happen. Uh, and then you can't function if your central bank doesn't function. So uh, uh, we decided we were going to attack this head on. Uh, we hired a 
uh, someone who had worked for us previously in Yemen. And we went through similar, uh, a similar problem in Yemen uh, when the Houthis uh, gained control, and that donors cut off funds, the World Bank cut off funds. And we managed to broker a deal uh, where funding was going through both UN agencies and NGOs you know, to pay civil servants to keep the country going in Yemen. We have managed to broker the same deal in Afghanistan. Uh, funding is starting to flow, not as much as we need. We managed to get the World Bank to lift some of its restrictions, uh, and they're doing a lot in the health sector now. But we need to do more, and the area that still needs a lot of work is the financial system and, and the central bank. Uh, huge, huge problems there that it is in the interests of the world uh, for Afghanistan not to implode. Not that anybody likes what's happening right today in Afghanistan, particularly when it comes to human rights. Um, so we will keep trying to do this going forward. My fear is seeing the backlash that we've seen on women, um, both in terms of how they have to dress and then whether they can travel by themselves. Uh, and then, of course, the fact that girls of a certain age are not in school. I fear that the breakthroughs that we made are going to dry up. Thank you. Hello. Um, oops. Um, thank you so much for uh, being here today and giving us um, your background and how you became um, UN Undersecretary. So my question has to do more of with the current structure of the United Nations. Um, so we see for the past 50 years, the same um, five countries hold the same positions in the Security Council. And the world is evolving. Countries are developing. Countries are growing. Do you think that? if that stru structure changed in some way and involved other countries, developing countries, would that help incentivize those countries to you know, push forward their human rights actions and their roles in women and education and development? Because the United Nations is supposed to epitomize unity, peacekeeping, and all of those things. But if the same five countries really control how are other countries supposed to trust and you know, want to get involved and really push um, you know, those other important um, parts of, you know, the world. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's a, this is a tough issue. Uh, and again, um, as a UN official, I always say this is a member state decision. Um, but I think you, what you can see now is, I, I'm not sure that uh, it's just a question of expansion. It's a question of who holds the veto. Uh, and there was a, 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 an initiative a few weeks ago uh, not to uh, do away with the veto, which I don't think is going to be possible, uh, given that it has to be ratified. But that would have to be ratified by member states, including the five who hold the veto. Uh, but there is an initiative today to um, hold the person who has uh, uh, put down a veto on a particular issue to report to the General Assembly on why it was necessary to reject such an initiative. Uh, that was just approved a, a couple of weeks ago. It was strangely approved unanimously, which was a surprise. Um, uh, but we had uh, US, France, and the UK, all of whom have uh, vetoes, sponsoring the resolution as well. So maybe that will make a change. That's where the block ends up being, mm -hmm. is with the veto. OK, thank you. Good morning, and thank you for being here. Two large parts that I hear are part of your life at the UN are hope and hard work. We have uh, friends, our family friends, who both live in Lebanon and live in the US. Mm -hmm. Could you speak briefly to the hard work that I know you're doing over there? And could you give us any hope that all of these many years will turn into something yeah. more normal? Thank, Thank you. you. Um, uh, Lebanon, Lebanon is, 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 as you know, um, in, in very, going through very difficult times. Um, the economy is in shatters. Uh, I was there last December, and I was really struck how different it was from when I was there a couple of years before that. Um, the lights were out. I mean, power goes out. And, you know, there's, in some places, you power for only a few hours a day. Uh, restaurants closed, and in Beirut is you know a lively was a lively city. 
um, very concerning, uh, but the divisions in the society continue among the various groups. Um, and I think it's going to take a real jolt to get them to move forward. What Lebanon needs is reforms, uh, and the World Bank IMF has laid out precisely what these reforms need to be. But because of lack of consensus among the various political parties and religious ethnic groups, there's been a difficulty in moving forward. <clears throat> I'm hoping uh, now that they've had new elections, that they can form a government quickly, uh, and that government can really get to the reforms that are needed, so at least the economy gets back on track. But that doesn't resolve the differences in the society. It doesn't resolve the fact that there are so many weapons outside of the control of the state, that, that we have a group and groups that are in control of weapons and that are functioning as semi-states in certain part of the country. And until that, until that is um, resolved, I think it's going to be very hard to see real movement forward. But I do think they can at least now make a, a go at some economic reforms that will help. Uh, so that, I mean, we know that people are losing savings. I mean, I, I have friends also who have relatives there and sending care packages. It's, it's pretty sad for such a prosperous place and such a place with such potential. And beauty. And beauty. Mm. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so we have time for one or two more questions, if anyone else. Yes, please. Um, I, hi, thank you for being here. I, I just wondered, um, when something happens abruptly, like Ukraine, is there a tendency to de there be kind of collateral explosions in other countries that have been simmering? Do you see that often? Uh, it is a concern. It's a major concern. Uh, as I said, there are the you know com countries that are simmering, as you've said, are fragile, uh, that have protracted conflicts or disagreements, and it's a real worry. It's a real worry that you know something could erupt, uh, and um, just you know out of the tensions in the world, anything a little bit of you know a food crisis that sets it off, um, or the fact that um, those who feel emboldened, uh, there may be you know one of the parties. In, conf not in sort of you know, semi-conflict, if you will, feels emboldened to move forward. Yes, some real concerns, and we're, we're looking at some areas fairly carefully. Yeah. I have a question for you. Um, what impact is global climate change having on conflicts around the world, and how is your office navigating that? It's, it's I mean, having a lot, <laughs> and it will have even more. I don't have all the the, the figures in my head, but we're looking at you know major problems with scarcity of water. So major, major movements of populations, and movements of populations usually cause, whether it be low-level conflicts or major conflicts, we're, we're, we will be seeing this. So we have to obviously deal with two issues. One is the climate change itself, which my department doesn't deal with, but we do deal with its impact. And we've already seen in so many places in Somalia, uh, in the Sahel, which is an area, if you talk about the next crisis on the horizon, it's this, this Sahel region of Africa. We see so many uh, sort of local conflicts because of movements of population. Uh, something that needs to be addressed, we can do all that we want on trying to diffuse an intercommunal conflict, you know, give uh, governments advance notice. Uh, we do do some tracking through satellite um, now on areas where water is becoming depleted uh, to give advance warning to governments, try to come up with a risk management um, initiative. Uh, that's all fine, but until we address the issue of climate itself, it's going to be really hard. We won't be able to keep up. All right, so uh, I just have a final question that we can close on. Um, we've talked about a lot of very serious stuff, and if you read the news today, most of it tends to be pretty depressing. What gives you hope in your work for the future um, of our world? Well, look, I think um, you have to look at this long term, uh, and that we see where countries have turned the corner, uh, you know, have been coming out of conflict, have turned the corner. Uh, things change. Uh, people can be quite resilient. 
uh, and we've got to invest in people. Uh, I think that's that's what I would say. And I, I am feeling that there are some things that we are doing that where we can make a difference and maybe a difference even in the very near future. Um, but we can't give up. So. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today.